The appointed hour is 6.30 having been reached. I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public hearing of the town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on a link on the town's webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. We'll begin with the roll call of the regular members of the ZBA. I'm here, Mr. Judge, I'm here. Uh, Mr. Langsdale. Ms. O'Meara. Ms. O'Meara, I think you're muted, but I know you're, I know you're there. Um, Ms. Parks. Here. Mr. Maxfield. Here. And the associate members, Ms. Waldman. Mr. Barrick. Here. Mr. Greeny. Here. And Mr. Meadows. Here. Also in attendance is Maureen Pollock, planner, and Dave Waschevich, building inspector. And, and Rob Mora. It, oh, Rob Mora is here as well. Great. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or, <clears throat> or additional information. <clears throat> after the board has completed its questions. Oh, really? Excuse me, there we go. <clears throat> I had a peanut before I started um, the, the call. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. This public speaks with the permission of the chair. <clears throat> if a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, please uh, state your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. <clears throat> the board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of its hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of the filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal prop period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. This hearing can be viewed on the town's web YouTube channel as well. Tonight, we have the following agenda, a public hearing on ZBA 2021-06 backyard ADUs request a special permit to allow a supplemental detached dwelling unit as accessory to a one family detached dwelling under sections 5.0111 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. 
located at 34 Baker Street, map 13D, parcel 46, neighborhood residents RN zoning district. This is continued from November 12th, our hearing on December, November 12th, 2020. Members sitting for this are Steve Judge, Ms. Parks, Mr. Maxfield, Ms. O'Meara, and Mr. Greening. ZBA FY 2021-10, Lawrence Hansen requests a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2004-41 in order to remove condition nine that requires a permit to expire upon chain of ownership and replace it with a condition that requires a new owner to submit a new management plan and complaint response for the ZBA review and approval at a public meeting located at 338 Pine Street, map 5B parcel 55, neighborhood residents RN zoning district. Members sitting for this matter are Mr. Judge, Ms. Parks, Mr. Maxfield, Ms. O'Meara and Mr. Greeny. The first order of business is ZBA FY 2021-06 backyard ADUs located at 34 Baker Street. We have received a request from the applicant to continue the hearing on this matter until February. I'm unaware that the applicant wishes to speak to the board on this. Uh, correct. I uh, spoke to the um, the applicant and uh, he submitted an email requesting the continuance to a date and time certain in February. And I said that I could, all, in addition, convey that to the board. So, uh, and I said that his attendance was optional for tonight. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board on the request to continue this matter? Are there any public comments regarding this matter? And I wanna remind the public that any comments on this matter shall be limited to whether this application will be continued until until February and not on the application itself. No indication of public comment. Um, hearing no further comments, I move we continue this matter until February 11th. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Park seconds. Is there any discussion on the motion to continue this till February 11th? If not, um, a vote occurs on the, the motion. It's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Greeny? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. This will, uh, we'll deal with this matter on our February 11th meeting. The next matter on the agenda is ZBA FY 2021, Lawrence Hans Hansen, requesting a special permit to modify a previously approved special permit, ZBA FY 2004-41, in order to remove a condition, number nine, that requires the permit to expire upon chain of ownership and replace it with a condition that requires a new owner to submit a new management plan and a complaint response form for the ZBA review and approval at a public meeting. It's located at 338 Pine Street, map 5B, parcel 55, neighborhood residents RN zoning district. We've received the following submissions, a modified management plan and a copy of special permit ZBA FY 2004-00041. Are there any disclosures from board members regarding this matter? Um, does the applicant wish to speak before the board? Uh, Larry, I've promoted you to uh, panelists, so you're able to um, unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, hearing me out. And um, no, no additional comments. We submitted all the paperwork. Mr. Hansen, just, just give your name and address for the record, please. Yeah, Lawrence Hansen, uh, 36 Jeremy Drive, Westfield, Mass. 
and yeah, we submitted all the paperwork. Um, I just wanted to attend just to see if you guys had any additional questions and um, that was about it. Uh, for the benefit of the board, the issue before us tonight is the desire to um, remove condition nine of the original special permit, which required um, upon change of ownership, um, that the special permit would expire. And instead, what's before us is that um, a new, with, upon change of ownership, a new a management plan and a complaint response form should be submitted to the ZBA for review and for um, approval at a public meeting. Uh, that's what you're requesting, correct? Mm -hmm. By way of, of background, um, there were a lot of, for the benefit of the board, there were a lot of um, special permits granted um, 15 and 20 years ago that had this provision. Often the ZBA has, um, when there is a change of ownership, has moved to amend the special permit to require that management and complaint response forms and plans be submitted to the ZBA and not have the special permit expire. Um, it's been something we've done quite a bit in the past, um, and that's by way of background to the, the members of the board. Does anybody have any any questions for the the applicant? Hearing none, are there any public comments regarding this? No public comments. Um, then I move that we modify special permit ZBA FY 2000-00041 by amending con condition nine to require that on change of ownership, the new owner submit a new management plan and a complaint response form for the ZBA review and approval at public hearing, and that we approve the management plan and the complaint response form submitted in uh, to the body uh, previously and that is in, in on our record today. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Maxfield seconds the motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? Mr. Mora. Oops. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanna clarify, you said public hearing. I think you meant public meeting. Thank you. I did mean public meeting. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, do we just yes, end Mr. the motion? Um, I'm, I ask, yeah, we should amend the motion. So we amend the motion to delete. I move we amend the motion to delete um, hearing and insert public, insert meeting. Second. Second it. We're going to need a roll call vote on that. I vote aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Greeny? Aye. Now we're discussing she's on the underlying motion. Any discussion on the underlying motion? If not, the vote occurs on the underlying motion as amended. Roll call vote. Yes, Mr. Green. Uh, um, I, I do have a question. Okay. So um, I don't know if anyone on the board knows or anyone present might know, but um, hasn't there been some change in um, owner occupancy requirements on duplexes since 2004? Is there any relevant uh, change in bylaws that has occurred between 2004 and now that would be relevant to our making this decision. Is anyone aware? Of it? I do not know the answer to that. No. Um, I don't think there's anything relevant, but I'll ask staff to opine on that if they know the answer. Um, I, I suppose I should, I should have been more, uh, ahead on this and looked into it, it seems to me there's been, there might've been something where 
requirements of owner occupancy on duplexes, some change in bylaw to that extent. Uh, I mean, to that effect. Anyway, I just, I, I, I'm asking in case yep. apparently no one knows. Uh, Mr. Mora. So since 2004, there's been a couple of changes uh, related to duplexes. Uh, one is that the bylaw established a different use classification for owner occupied and non-owner occupied duplexes. Uh, the other change that occurred in recent years is that in a non-owner occupied duplex, uh, the permit actually does expire, uh, but only in the RG district. This is in the RN district. Uh, so if this one was being permitted today, the, the current thinking of the board in recent years is not to expire permits on the change of ownership and rather put the condition that you've uh, is part of your motion now. So I give you the answer, Mr. Greeny. Um, to some extent, uh, anyway, yeah. Any further comments or questions? There being none, this is a roll call vote and it's on the motion to um, amend condition nine and to uh, condition uh, accept the management and the complaint response form. Uh, I vote aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Greeny? Aye. Motion is unanimous. Motion carries. Thanks, Larry. So, uh, Larry, we'll provide you a, a special permit uh, after the board reviews the decision and signs it um, and is filed with the town clerk. Um, we'll provide you a copy um, so then you can record it with the registry of deeds. Um, okay. But, uh, the cover letter will, will go into detail of, of all the steps that are needed. Okay. Great. Thank you. Since there is no other matters before the public hearing, I move we close the public hearing and open a public meeting uh, to deal with administrative matters and for the board discussion. Um, do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. It's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Greeny? Aye. All right. Um, we're now in a public meeting to uh, the, the agenda for which is to discuss some administrative matters for the board. Um, I thought this was really a good thing to do just to kind of follow up with board members on, um, you know, some things that we, I think we should be thinking about and give you an opportunity to ask questions or to make suggestions. Is I don't, I really, on balance, I think this board has functioned really well. And I think the members have spent a lot of time, given a lot of effort. It's really been difficult over the last nine months to conduct these meetings and to participate in these meetings via Zoom. It's just very odd and weird and we're all getting used to it. But I think that the board as a whole has done just a tremendous job. And I thank each one of you and compliment each one of you for the work you've done, as well as the support we've gotten from our staff, which is we just frankly couldn't do it without them. So there's nothing that I, there's nothing earth shaking here that I, I think we need to talk about. But I do think it's important just as a reminder to go through a few things um, for how we operate as a board and also give you the chance to ask some questions and, to, and also finally give you some information that we've had and provide some opportunities for you to have input into the uh, potential modification of the zoning bylaws in the future of the, uh, the town. So the first item I'd like to go over is just a little bit about site visits. Um, and site visits are something that we do, you know, at, that you've all participated in. And it's really important that the site visit be limited to just 
getting a feel for the where the, the building on the ground where it sits, how it sits with the neighbors, the proposed space, the lot lines. If it's we're looking at internal stuff, inside in, interior stuff, how it all it's how the physic how it's physically set up. It really is not the opportunity for us to engage in a discussion with the applicant about the the value of it, why they're doing it, what the reason is, what the neighbors are thinking about it, how they've thought, how they've gone through their whole thought process. That's more appropriately dealt with at the public meeting. And indeed, each the, each question we ask, we should be also at the public meeting asking that question, and and then putting it out for the record. So I think it's really important that these site visits be focused just on you know the, the just the facts, ma'am. Uh, kind of from, um, I don't know if any, Keith is probably the only one on this call. Keith and I are the only ones on the call that remember a dragnet, but um, it is kind of <laughs> just just the facts ma'am approach to yeah. the, to the to a, a site visit. And then those questions that we all have, and we all do this, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody on this, but we all do this, but those questions really should be weighed, um, held off until we have the public hearing. So the fight, the, the notion is to kind of get in, get out, get the facts, get a sense of the feel of, the, of the, the site, and then move on. And I also think it's important that the chairman or was ever the, chair, the acting chair in that case, open up and give that sort of context to the applicant. And then we really want to rely a lot to a large extent on staff to make sure we're moving along and that we're not um, engaged in too much discussion. So I'd just like to encourage everybody to keep the site visits uh, on focus, on topic, and not kind of veer off into a lot of other, a lot of other things other than just seeing the site, seeing how the, the building or the, or the um, facility fits in with the, the area. And so you can have a better sense of how to make a decision on this from being physically there. Are there any comments or questions? Maureen. I just wanted to uh, put uh, if Keith wants to uh, indicate that he's here for the record. Here. Yep. Oh, and, and Joan, we didn't get your um, you as well, Miss O'Meara. We need you just to to um, say that you're here, here. Right, present. Yep. And another thing that I wanted to then discuss is is board decorum. Um, and again, this is made more difficult and or it's, it's, it's weirder in on Zoom. We lose that body language. We lose all sorts of, uh, we're sort of these dis disconnected bodies that are on these little squares and it makes it more difficult. And I think we've conducted these meetings pretty well. Um, and I think everybody has, has uh, behaved really excellently. But I think it's a time just to remind us all of a couple things. I had this, I, one of these meetings that I know you've been going to, Dylan, uh, Mr. Maxfield, from the, the sponsor to kind of help us um, become better board members, I received a, a, um, an article that really kind of goes through how to be a really good board member and some of the things you should keep in mind. And I'm going to give that to Maureen and ask her to distribute it. But there's a couple of, of the 25 different short things that this article identifies. There's a couple I would like to highlight. And the first one is that we are really, we really do want to create a good impression of the board for the public. And we have to remember that for a lot of people, this will be their most important, in some cases, their first real dealing with the, with the town, with the town government. And if it's dealing with their home or their business or their, uh, their property, this is really important to them. And they may not be very, um, they may be very nervous. They may be very uncertain about this. And it's really important that we give that we give the impression that this is a this that the town works, that the, that we care about this, that we treat it, or we're treating this fairly, and that we're taking it seriously. And I think we've done that. But it's also really important just to remember that that overall that's one of the most important things we we should be doing. I also would like to encourage everybody to be on time and to be a couple minutes early. I think 10 minutes early gives us the opportunity just to say hello to each other, um, to, to kind of to coalesce as a group ahead of time. And we're not just kind of starting off cold. It was, it's normal in, we're not gonna talk about issues. We're not gonna talk about matters before us. We're not gonna deliberate. We're not gonna violate the open meeting law. 
but it's important to be, I think it's important to give us some time just so that we as a board are more familiar with each other than just at the meetings. So 10, 10 minutes ahead of time, uh, that means we can get started on time and we're gonna talk about how we schedule things here in a second. But I'd like to encourage people to come in 10 minutes early if they can. It just gives us a chance to start on time all the, as often as possible. One other thing that I that I feel is important is I wanna make sure we enforce with applicants the rule to get us the material ahead of time so that you can have enough time to review it. Most of you work full-time jobs. I don't, I'm lucky I'm, I'm no longer working, but many of you do. And it's, we get a lot of material and it's really difficult if you don't get it ahead of time. So one of the things that we're gonna to continue to do is require that applicants get, get material to us seven days ahead of time and that there aren't any material changes or of any significance before that so that we can have the material to study. Because if you're, you're working a full-time job, it's really, you have to really make time for this. And I'm aware of that. <clears throat> and I think whether that the applicant is represented by an attorney or just a, a, a person at, representing themselves, there's no reason that we can't expect them to put the um, information to us in seven days ahead of time. So we have ap ap um, adequate time to review it. Mr. Langsdale. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> just a question on that. Uh, if for some reason we don't get something for uh, for like a day or two ahead and it's it is a significant amount of material, uh, what recourse do we take? Well, I think we continue the hearing. If it's, I mean, that's the that's the ultimate recourse we can have is that we just we don't have time to. We can either listen to the hearing and say we we and listen to the applications pre presentation, and say we don't have enough time to review this. We have uh, we have to continue this to a later point, or we can tell them you, ahead of time we didn't get it in in advance. We intend to continue this. You, and you may or may not want to show up at this meeting, but we are going to continue this because this is voluminous material. It's, it's uh, significant and the board hasn't had time to review it and it violates the board's rules. So I think okay. those are the two options we have. Yeah, good. thanks. Yeah, we have to be willing to do that, right? Uh, right. Um, yep, Maureen. Also, I just want to say, you know, sometimes an applicant um, for these larger projects uh, will have some things that are submitted in a timely manner, but then things happen and, and they, it is, you know, just a few days before the meeting. So an, another option is, is to say, oh, well, you know, the board can review the things that you, you provided uh, in, in an advance notice, at least seven days. And then, you know, if the board decides to can hold that meeting, you could review those items and then say, oh, well, we only had 24 hours, uh, you know, uh, to have this new material or whatever the, the amount of time um, and say, we'll take that up at the next meeting. So you could do some review um, of, of yeah. the project uh, instead of sort of dismissing it all. So it is all project specific of, of what the details are, but. Good. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is, um, and I'm, this is one where I'm talking, I'm myself to blame for this. Um, but I really think it's important that we avoid being engaged in an adverse, in a kind of an adversarial relationship or d discussion with applicants, the public, the representatives. Um, we really are, we are more a semi-judicial body than we are like a legislative body. And I have a, I've seen too many congressional hearings and not enough sort of judicial hearings that I kind of fall into the trap of back and forth with, um, with a, an applicant at times. I, I, I remember one case where I've done that and I regret that. And I think it's really important that we give everybody the opportunity to speak uh, we don't take it personally, and we don't take, um, you know, sort of defend the, the, uh, the nature of the body or, or the, the, the ZBA. But I think that it's important that we let people speak, and even if they are, they want to tell us off, we, we accept it, we hear it, we don't respond to it, and we don't have to respond to it. 
that we're more, we ought to think of ourselves as more <clears throat> a semi-judicial body rather than a legislative body where you have a kind of a back and forth in terms of uh, tone, not in terms of information, but in terms of tone. And so I think that's something I, I found myself doing uh, recently. I don't wish to do it anymore. And I think we all should abide by that um, admonition if we could. Um, but those are the, I will, but you're gonna receive this, it's called Riggins Rules. Um, I think it's pretty good. It provides some, some context for this, but those, those are things that I think I'd like to have us work upon over the next year um, as we continue in, the, in this body. And I hope that uh, you'll get a chance to see this. Maureen will, sh will share it with you. But I'd certainly open, if you, other people have questions about either decorum, deportment, the way the, the meeting is handled or conducted, this is a good time to bring that up. Okay. Uh, wait, uh, oh, Dylan. Mr. Maxfield. Yep, Mr. Sorry, Maxfield. Uh, I, I missed literally the last part you were saying as, as um, I was Googling Riggins rules. Uh, we're bringing up anything <laughs> related to, uh, to decorum here right now? Yep, yep. Um, I guess, I don't know, the, the last thing, I, you know, something I've been thinking about, which probably isn't as necessary if we were all meeting in person, but maybe we want to might consider this a little bit more while we're still meeting on Zoom regularly. Um, maybe everybody kind of seeking recognition from the chair as, as we kind of move, because I know I'm talking with applicants where maybe I want to ask an applicant a question where I'll find usually while I'm still kind of getting there, you know, they might, they might chime in with something and start replying where I, I don't know, sometimes I feel it would be a little bit better if after I've asked that they still seek recognition from the chair to respond to the question where something where we're all meeting in person and we have it, it, it might not be necessary, but it feels a little bit, you know, when you're on, you're on the walkie talkie, you have to say over when you're finished. So people know your, your fingers off the button, you know, while we're mm -hmm. over Zoom, it might make, if anybody else is feeling this way that maybe everybody seeks Mr. Chair may I be able to respond to this just so that way we don't kind of have people talking over each other on zoom which I feel happens a little bit in this format so I don't know mm -hmm. if while we're doing this uh, remote format that that for for all cases to speak that everyone seeks recognition from the chair simply to to kind of keep things moving without people talking over each other what what's everybody's thoughts on that well, if I, I'll just respond quickly. It, it, we should always do that. I mean, the, the question, the, the real need is to seek recognition of the chair all the time. And uh, you all can help with that by doing it, by helping out. And, and, I, and it's important for me to try to enforce that um, in, as a, in as delicate and diplomatic, or not delicate, but as diplomatic a way as possible that, um, that you seek recognition from the chair before you speak. And with the public, that's the chair's responsibility. Uh, to make sure that they um, seek recognition before they, or applicants seek recognition before they speak. So I, I appreciate that comment, Mr. Maxfield. I think you're right. Um, and that all of us can, all of us can do better with that. And the chair has to be the one to, to impose that discipline. And I will. Any other comments or questions or suggestions for sort of decorum and deportment of the board? Any concerns that you guys have? Good. Um, one of the things that we have historically done is had this meeting start at six and end at nine. We try to, to, to have it end at nine. Three hours is a long time. It's It runs over at times, but the notion is if we can't, if we know we can't finish it in a few minutes after nine o'clock, we're gonna continue it. We're gonna to try to keep that as much as possible. After nine, um, I think it's just, it just becomes a really long day. And I don't feel that, especially if you're working and you gotta be at work at eight or nine o'clock the next morning, we've pretty much shot your evening. Mm -hmm. um, but this year we moved it back to 6.30 for a couple of good reasons. Number one, we had people whose work schedule changed because of the COVID and uh, we wanted to accommodate them. And two, we have uh, one member who's also on another board that tends to meet on the same day. And I'm wondering if, if we, I'd, I'd like to know about the board's consensus 
if we can move back to six o'clock as much as possible, um, as often as possible and have a and full three hours. I think it's hard to go to 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. I really prefer not to. I hate to lose the other uh, 30 minutes if we start at 6.30 all the time. So my question is for, I guess, Mr. Maxfield and Ms. O'Meara, is it gonna be possible for you with your schedule to have the meeting at six? And is it possible for you, Mr. Maxfield, um, to work with your other committee to either meet on another day or per perhaps end earlier? I know you get off of work at five and then you have to go to one meeting and then you come to the other. So I'm sensitive to that, but I don't know if there's a way that you can work with your other committee to try to um, provide that flexibility and, and Ms. Ms. O'Meara, whether your schedule still allows you to, to work at, to come to six o'clock meetings. So Mr. Maxfield first and then Ms. O'Meara. Yeah. yeah, so what I've um, been trying to do with my other meeting is because we typically meet bi-monthly. So I try to now stagger it where one week is the Board of Licensing Commissioners and the next week will be the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I know with the holidays, I don't, I don't think there's any overlap. Um, I have to double check my schedule on that. But I know going forward from January, this is a discussion I'm gonna be having with them as well of saying Thursday nights are fine, but it has to be, they can't coincide with each other. So that way it would be, uh, I could do ZBA at six and then uh, board of licenses at five on the night set that isn't. Um, but I will coordinate um, once we get our next schedule going forward from January, coordinating to make sure that there's no overlap with ZBA and then anywhere where there might be an overlap, say I can come to that meeting, but that's gonna be a half hour in and out. We're just approving licenses and moving on. We can have our discussions another night. So going back to six uh, shouldn't be an issue uh, for me, just so long as we know uh, in advance which which nights that we're meeting, which it looks like we have our, our schedule set. I think into what, January, February, we've got meetings already set. So we, we know when we're meeting. So I don't think it would be an issue for me to move back to six, 6 p.m. Okay. Ms. O'Meara, I saw your hand up. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, 6, 6 p.m. works for me. Thank you. Great, great. Good enough. So I think we can probably work that through. Well, let's try to have six o'clock meetings then. Is there anybody else that has an opinion on this or a, or a conflict? Mr. Langsdale. I don't have a conflict and I, I think six o'clock is, is best. Uh, the only thing that concerns me is sometimes we'll have two or three uh, uh, hearings and one will take long and then we're the last one may be uh, uh, I don't know a, a very simple kind of thing uh, just a, a family trying to do something with their property and we we, we get to nine o'clock and we're not done with them because the other things have run long that if we, I, I'm just concerned that we allow them more time in that evening to go to 9.30 or so, just so we don't have to continue something that may end up going three or four weeks further down the road that's really not that uh, convoluted, that it's really kind of simple that, that, that that we can have the flexibility, that's what I'm getting to, thank yeah. you, uh, the flexibility to deal with that uh, without going, you know, nine o'clock, we're out of here. Yeah, I think that's- and, and that's- and that hopefully won't be all, you know, often at all, but just so that maybe that in terms of scheduling, we maybe think about that in terms of each night, uh, what might take longer so that if there's, something that will take longer that we can then say, okay, it's nine o'clock, we're not gonna continue it. Uh, but we're not then hurting the, the smaller uh, application, I'll say it that way. Yeah, I think that's something we should be sensitive to. There's one way to do it is to put some of the quick, that we think are quick early on the agenda, if that's, and we get that done early um, yeah. in the meeting at six right away. It all depends, some of these meetings are um, we have to go back and forth, but we'd have to, we have both hearings and meetings. So, um, but I think the most important thing is to have some flexibility to try to deal with the simple things if we can yeah. and have some flexibility in time. I think it's a good suggestion. Good. All right. 
Any other comments? Those are both good. Any questions? I have a quick question. Yes, um, yes Ms. Parks. Ever, is it ever possible to change the order of how things are heard? I guess uh, from what Keith was saying, you know, if you know something's going to take, you know, is something really simple that is not going to take very much time. I mean, I know there's no guarantee on that, um, but are you allowed to do that or is that something you're not allowed to do? I, well, the agenda can be, I'm going to ask Maureen on, to opine on this as well, but the agenda can be set ahead of, should be set ahead of time. And what I, I worry that once the agenda is set and public notice is out, we have to follow the agenda unless we make a mo some kind of a motion to move them. But, you know, Maureen, Rob, Dave, can you talk to us about a flexibility we have on the, on the agenda? Yes, Mr. Mora. Uh, when we're not setting times, which we usually do not, so we don't have a hearing at 6, 6.30, 7, I think there's some flexibility and it's not uncommon for the chair to recognize that, uh, you know, something could be disposed of quickly and, and might choose to do that and move it up in the schedule. So I think the chair has that option uh, even at, at the opening of the hearing. But I have one other suggestion. This is something the board used to do quite often. Maybe Keith remembers it if he was uh, around during this time is that when the, when the chair sees that, you know, maybe they've had a really long one or two hearings, 815, 820, uh, and is not through that, that hearing and still has another one to open up, uh, the board might decide to close the public hearing and kind of put that one aside until later and not uh, complete their deliberation and their finding or their conditions and vote on it and go through the 10.3 findings and open that public hearing for that, you know, that last group that's waiting to be heard. And if the board has time, come back to it to that public uh, meeting portion of that earlier case, finish it out uh, or continue it uh, if it's too late. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to get everybody heard, all the, all the uh, presentation done and uh, all the applicants, you know, a reasonable time to be given to, to, to make their case and um, have the board react and, and kind of give them an indication of how things are looking uh, in, that, in that first initial setting. It's good to know we have that flexibility. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Good question, Ms. Parks. Anything else? All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is discussions about recommendations to the planning board regarding modification of the zoning bylaws. As I think most of you know, um, the planning board has been, been tasked with um, reviewing the zoning bylaws and making, I think, recommendations to the town council. Um, and this is a process that's going to take a little bit of a little bit of time. It's not going to be done quickly, um, but it is an opportunity for us, with the experience we have with the zoning with the zoning bylaw, um, to provide input to the planning board on changes that we think are important. And we'd like things that we'd like to see. And so, what I wanted to do is first, either Rob or Maureen or Dave, let us know about. Tell us, can you kind of set the schedule? And then, secondly, just really tell you, tell you that this is something that over the next couple of months, I think we'll be able to look at. And if we have have suggestions for the planning board, uh, that we should put them either as a letter, as a as a motion, or just empower the chairman to go and and talk to the, the zoning board chairman and discuss these changes, but some way communicate them at some point in the future. But really uh, over the next couple of months, take a look at the, take a look at the zoning bylaws and, and through your, your, your history with them, your work with the committee, um, make any suggestions that you think we can just consider as a board, we can consider suggestions and make those suggestions to the planning board. But Rob, could you um, talk about the, uh, the process that's being used to review and then potentially modify the zoning bylaws. Um, so I just let, uh, let you know a little bit of what's, what's going on right now. Um, we are at the very beginning of really looking at uh, the bylaw page by page. Uh, the, the tasks are broken up uh, that staff is doing some of that work 
uh, and the CRC is doing some of that work and the planning board is uh, doing work as well as they always do. Uh, the, the bigger discussions of bylaw changes are beginning to occur at the CRC, the Community Resources Committee. Uh, that's the, the committee to the town council. Uh, in, their, in their latest meeting, the town council meeting, uh, the CRC brought to them a recommendation on priorities uh, to address in the zoning bylaw. And like I said, they're really focused on some of the bigger items, the downtown zoning, inclusionary zoning, affordable housing, uh, and there's a really long list of things that are being worked on. And staff uh, will be working on uh, more of those technical fixes, corrections, missing definitions, um, incorrect references in the bylaw, and reformatting. So we're trying to give it a, a, a cleaner, fresh look, easier to read, uh, easier to follow, uh, straighten out some of the tables, uh, take all this criteria out of the table format and put it into more of the, the narrative uh, format and uh, in, in make the table a little cleaner and easier to read. Uh, so at the very beginning of this, uh, so it's a great time for the zoning board to, you know, either individual members or at administrative meetings to uh, work on any suggestions they have, get them to staff. Uh, it may not necessarily be uh, the, the old process that we knew when we were, uh, you know, a town meeting uh, a form of government where the zoning subcommittee and zoning board would talk about all these changes. Uh, staff will be bringing them to the CRC. We'll be drafting uh, uh, proposals and presenting them there first, and then ultimately going to planning board public hearings and town council public hearings. Uh, for adoption. Uh, so I think you're going to start to see this happen um, more aggressively as we go into the new year. Uh, there's, a, I think, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of uh, kind of built up uh, interest in, in, in making the bylaw better. Uh, so I think it's a good time to get involved uh, and just let us know through Maureen or, you know, anybody, uh, uh, you know, what you're thinking and what we can do to help and get that, that information and certainly join those meetings. You know, they're going to, their CRC meetings are held generally uh, early afternoon, uh, twice a month. And, and then of course the, the discussions will ultimately happen at evening meetings with the planning board and zoning board, uh, town council as we uh, go into the new year. Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, let's move on to the next item then. Um, Ms. Pollock, do you want to talk about uh, standard conditions and the resident manager? Those are the two next items. Oh, sure. Um, so just uh, to start with the standard conditions for residential uses, um, you know, um, the board has had um, conditions relative uh, to the uh, you know rental housing uh, regarding um, the amount of people that can be on the premises at one time, um, uh, for instance, at a party or, or something like that. And then the other standard condition that has been historically used by the board um, is about how many guests can uh, stay overnight and for how many consecutive uh, nights in a row. Um, and uh, I don't know if Rob wants to talk about how, um, you know, the intention of those conditions um, relative to, you know, uh, this, you know, college town and, and um, uh, protecting, uh, you know, the neighborhood and the property owner and the tenants themselves with these um, conditions. Mr. Morrow. Sure. Um, these conditions have, you know, they've changed over the years. Um, when I had first come to work in Amherst, uh, the standard condition would be something like no more than four occupants in, in a dwelling unit. And it sounds good uh, and, and, you know, helps support the decision. But, you know, when we're in, a for in an enforcement position and uh, there's a, a property that's having some trouble and uh, the neighborhood remembers those hearings and, and calls attention to those conditions. 
uh, we find that, you know, the reality is that's really difficult to enforce. Uh, you know, the boyfriend, the girlfriend staying over, you know, uh, the number of cars that are in the driveway, a little more than four, uh, the, the indicators there. And it really was difficult, I think, for us to either make any enforcement and uh, satisfy the, uh, the legitimate concerns that the neighbors had. Uh, so we, we suggested years ago that um, if we're going to put a limit on the number of occupants that uh, we talk about guests and just you know, be clear up front that yeah, there's, there's full-time regular conditions where there's four unrelated individuals living there, but there's also other situations that occur that have uh, a guest staying or uh, an extra vehicle parked there that isn't um, always there. Uh, and that led us to trying to establish well, what is the duration and you know, consecutive days or overall duration that makes sense. And that's changed a little over time and really you know, based on the situation, the, the neighborhood, the, um, the history of the property, uh, you know, the board has you know, dealt with that differently, but you know, typically it's you know, some small number of days up to seven maybe. Um, so you know, that's something that has, um, has helped us when we're dealing with, with issues, at least it gives us uh, and the property owner a, um, a clearer standard uh, to, to try to comply with. Uh, the other one about larger gatherings, uh, you know, we see less of this as a problem uh, than, than we did in, in prior years. Uh, there are a lot of good things going on with party registration through the police and, and campus uh, monitoring that. Um, our, our code enforcement and, and community outreach officer, Bill Laramie, uh, will you know, hold meetings with uh, uh, neighborhoods, with uh, new tenant groups that move into properties that historically have had larger gatherings. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's pretty typical that we see in leases without even, you know, the board's involvement in a property, uh, there'd be a limit on, on the number of uh, guests that can be there at a gathering at one time. Uh, sometimes the, with permission of the owner, uh, that could be exceeded. Uh, so I think that's pretty standard and has worked well. Uh, I think, um, you know, certainly the, the ones that the board have issued permits for, uh, you know, we typically see 10 guests per, you know, per dwelling unit as a number. Uh, we have seen higher numbers, uh, but I think there's enough other tools in place for us to adequately respond to that situation if needed. And it really is all about um, kind of for uh, on our uh, standpoint, it's really about gauging the response that we get from the property owner to the situation. It isn't so much that the party or gathering occurred or uh, you know, the guests stayed over for five nights. It really is about what is, you know, what is the property owner doing to uh, maybe more hands-on or more uh, adequately manage the property if it needs to be managed uh, in, a, in a more um, controlling way. And that's really what we look to try to uh, get out of the property owners or managers. Many, many times this is in response to concerns from neighbors who, um, right, a lot of times this is a condition that's been in response to neighbors um, having worried about large parties or having instead of four people living there, really eight people are living there and, and you really want to control that because it's both the neighbors and the town has a desire not to have overcrowded um, rental housing especially in a college town is that is that the motive that the uh the reason these kind of conditions began rob i i think it is part of it uh you know certainly whenever a neighborhood or, or public is involved with a uh, a case um it it almost puts the board in a position to have to address this in order to adequately support their findings uh and to make mm -hmm. their determination that it is not more detrimental to the neighborhood to add this additional dwelling unit or expand it or whatever the, the request may be. So it becomes a good tool for that. Um, and, it, and it is there to, to reinforce the bylaw requirement, which is uh, you know, no more than four unrelated. And you know, the, the group of conditions that go along with that, whether it's related to parking or gatherings or guests, all 
are, are there to support that, you know, that bylaw being complied with. And, you know, this is really, you know, much more important before the rental regulations were adopted uh, because it's all we had. Now, we, you know, the rental regulations have been really successful in doing what it was set out to do and really, you know, bring attention to a property, make known who the owner and manager is, uh, highlight deficiencies and violations right on the, the, the mapping system on the public, uh, you know, website. Uh, so that's available contact information. So I think all of that, the, the vast majority of the properties, you know, are very well managed by uh, owners or develop, you know, investors, owners, or property managers that really do take it seriously. And the problems we have are with a really small number. Uh, of properties, so I think I think that's been uh, really helpful. Uh, we are complaint response, so it really you know we're not out there patrolling the town looking for problems, trying to correct them, but responding to the complaint, uh, and that's the, the way the program and our our department was designed and structured. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Yes. Is there? Ms. Parks. Is there an easy place to find the information to uh, to contact the town about problem properties, because I I you know in the past I had had a problem with a rental property with too many cars parked and having our driveway blocked, and the only thing I knew to do was you know it happened to be run by Eagle Crest and so you know I had their number on speed dial and was constantly calling them. Um, but I didn't know that there were that I could have gone to the town and said, you know, this these are in, these guys are in violation. Is is that like published somewhere so that you know citizens know that? It, yes, it is. Uh, so on on the website uh, through the rental uh, residential rental permitting pages, uh, there's a couple options. You can get right to email contacts for me. Uh, John Thompson, the code enforcement officer, any other inspector in the department, but there's also an, an online complaint uh, system. So you can file your complaint online, you can upload pictures, uh, you can make it anonymous, uh, you can ask for a response, uh, and, and the person making the complaint will get one. Uh, those can be filed 24-7, uh, and it goes directly to a, a small group of, of staff that will respond to those and divide them up to the, um, you know, the proper staff person. Um, submit a complaint right there. Yep, Maureen is, is right at that place. So that's, that's the way most of our complaints are um, received now. Uh, you know, we'll get them over the weekend. They'll come in the middle of the night. Um, in fact, we'll get complaints about anything, you know, uh, the sidewalk not being shoveled, the, the trees not being trimmed back in certain areas. And, you know, we'll kind of manage that and, and send it off the proper department that might be handling that case. But it, uh, it is a pretty well used uh, way of filing complaints. Um, of course, you know, you can call or email directly is another way of doing it. And, you know, occasionally we'll get a written uh, request. About a to deal with something with a property, Mr. Langsdale. A uh, couple of things. One, uh, this complaint response that we were just uh, looking at. Would it be possible for us to include that in the complaint response that is given to the abutters uh, with phone numbers? of the owner and uh, management so that people understand that there is more than one avenue uh, to travel to make a complaint uh, rather than just saying it's on the website. If we could give them concrete uh, instructions on how to make those complaints, uh, that's one. Um, uh, Mr. Mara, uh, one of the things that I know that, that we have dealt with in the past is in with parking um, and not just, not just for parties, but for like if suddenly there are eight people living in a place or only supposed to be four, 
suddenly there's like two or three cars parking on lawn. Um, it, that is something that we've always, as I remember it, um, uh, I think made a condition about, but is there something more we can do about that in terms of, um, my, my understanding is that that's, a, that, pro, that, that doing that is against the bylaws and therefore uh, is something that can be dealt with through your, uh, your office. Um, is there something we can do to strengthen that in terms of <laughs> one, the bylaw and two, in terms of uh, conditions? Uh, so I definitely, um, you know, favor conditions, even if they repeat what the bylaw does, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially if we're in a, in a situation where there's known to be a problem or um, a neighborhood that's really concerned about it. Uh, I think getting it as a condition with special permit um, just draws additional attention to it. It's a document that's recorded against the property. I think that's, a, 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 you know, a wise decision. Once the, once the violation is identified, uh, we're notified and respond to it and you know, can, can find evidence of the violation, uh, the rest is pretty much handled by you know, the, the laws that we have. You know, they, they're, they're given a period of time to comply with it. They're subject to the penalties that the, the, the non-criminal disposition allows and um, you know, we'll use those and if we need to. 99% of the time, the issue is dealt with just on a simple request. Um, I mean, there's, there's really good response and good communication to our office. Um, what gets tricky is when you have those eight cars at a property uh, that we're trying to understand is, you know, how regular of a condition is that? And does it, is it an indicator of some other problem? And that takes time, uh, you know, the code enforcement officer will uh, monitor the property for a period of time before taking any action because we know ultimately if we have to go into court, which is our, our next place to go to get any sort of uh, support and enforcement, we need to have a good case established. So we need to be pretty certain that we have a violation there. Uh, so we've got the tools, um, we have, um, you know, staff, uh, typically available uh, pretty rapidly for complaints that are made. Uh, and then, you know, depending on what the situation is, there are longer term uh, monitoring needed in order to establish that violation, uh, which honestly, most times do not result in finding any violation because it's just really difficult to. Okay. Uh, I'll just add the, um, the the parking on the parking on the lawn is not permitted. Uh, it must be on paved surfaces. So that's one that we typically find in residential districts, and only two cars are permitted in the front uh, setback of those properties. Uh, those are the two major uh, parking related uh, violations that we would find in a residential district. Thank you. <clears throat> I guess one, one question I have, and I don't know the answer to this, is, is, is there an annual notification from a, a renter, from a rental unit to its neighbors that here's, the, here's my number, here's the complaint response form? Is there some way that the neighbors get an, uh, an annual notice or is it um, done just, just through the special permit process and after that the, the neighbors have to go to the, um, to the town website to try to, um, lodge a complaint the the only notice would be by the renewal of the rental permit which you'd have mm -hmm. to go into our website to view that to get the information of the emergency contact and their phone number so other than that unless we were to make that a condition of a special permit um, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be any other requirement to notice annually to the neighbors okay Good. Um, other topics to discuss, Maureen, I know we were going to talk about the resident manager. It was one of the things that I that seemed to come out as a um, one of our recent 
items it was contained in there and, and there's some question about not relating to that specific case but question about the history of residential managers at times and can we just talk a little bit about that generally without right. being specific so i'm going to keep rob on a roll because <laughs> the, and, and then there's another topic that i think rob would be good on so uh so uh resident manager i i, I can read the definition in the zoning bylaw which is under section 12.441 is uh, a live-in resident of a rental residential use qualified and responsible for implementation of the property management plan and for managing and, uh, and uh, coordinating the maintenance housekeeping and administrative duties for the rental units under their charge and so under the um, the converted dwelling section of the bylaw uh, there's a requirement that if the if the property is, uh, the property would have to be either owner occupied or that there would have to be a resident manager for that dwelling unit and um, you know there's as you sort of indicated Steve there's been sort of I don't know um, a healthy um, discussion about uh, resident manager and you know what does that really mean um, I know I just said the definition to you um but i wanted to we wanted just to see if anyone on the board had questions about it um in a, and also if you know if rob has any other comments about it as well the only question i have about it is is that um it, it comes up in more than just one case so it's been uh, something that i've observed in other cases but i'm just wondering how valuable that is as a um as a as a check on the property owner and the check on the on disturb try to to reduce disturbances in the neighborhood and whether that is valuable and whether that is one of the kinds of things we ought to be looking at for the and i'm not making that decision now but i'm wondering if that's one of the kinds of things we ought to be looking at in terms of changes to the bylaws so what's your experience on that and is it do you find it a valuable uh, provision So this is this is a section of the bylaw that I don't think um, does what it may have been intended to do. Uh, that definition suggests uh, a lot more out of an individual uh, named the resident manager than what actually occurs. Uh, and you know, it's really rare for for us when we're dealing with a problem situation to to really get any, you know, anything more out of a resident manager than access to the property or coordinating a meeting with tenants. Uh, and, and I think it, it kind of makes sense that a, a property owner or a property manager can only give so much responsibility to one of the four tenants living in the dwelling unit. Uh, and, I, and I think we, you know, we've come to, you know, quickly move past the resident manager and focus more on our dealings with the uh, with the property owner or, prop, or a property management company, which is what we're really looking for is a higher level uh, of management in a situation that uh, is causing some sort of conflict in the neighborhood. Uh, I, just a, you know, our approach generally when we have a when, when we have an issue is to address it to the owner of the property, and we're not we're not telling the owner what to do or how to do it. We're identifying the issue and we're telling them to tell us how they're going to respond to it. I've never had a property manager or owner uh, use the prop, the resident manager as part of that solution. Uh, so even in the situations where they're required under in the converted dwelling section, uh, I, I feel like the prop, the resident manager uh, roles diminished really quickly. Uh, and, and almost, you know, is a, a, a point person for us to contact the group or make an arrangement for access to the property. So, I, you know, I don't think it's, um, you know, all that valuable now. I think it may have had a, a, a larger uh, purpose or intent before the reg rental regulations were adopted. Um, and maybe we just never saw that develop uh, you, you see that develop the way it was envisioned originally because the rental regulations kind of picked up and took things to a new level, which um, they general the, the regulations generally say, if there's a violation, you need to correct that or show us how you're correcting and responding to the situation 
and you need to do that uh, uh, effectively. Uh, otherwise, you're at risk of losing your your right to to rent that property. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I don't I don't feel like this is um, we have to deal with it because it's a, a provision in the bylaw. Once we get that initial notice at the hearing of who a resident manager is, or, or, or that there will be one, we generally do not get notice of the new resident manager as the tenancies change over time. Thanks, Mr. Mora. Mr. Greeny. Oh, you're, there we go. So um, just a few comments. I've been on McClellan Street for 25 years and I, I'm not remembering the exact, I, I don't know when you came to town, Rob, but um, uh, things improved a great deal. Uh, after those uh, renter registration um, bylaws or whatever they are were established. And, and a lot of that came out of uh, a group of people in that area, especially on Fearing Street. So I, I don't know if you're aware of a study that was done by Rolf Karlstrom, where he uh, documented that problem properties were never in any single case uh, an owner occupied property. And so what came out of that study that he did probably 12 years ago or something like that was the, uh, the powerful deterrent that owner occupancy has on um, problem properties. And it's you know, maybe outside of the scope of this discussion, but it's occurred to me over the years, and I should probably talk to the CRC or the planning board about this, that um, in addition, the, the owner occupancy um, requirement not, not only is almost a guarantee that a property will not be a problem property, uh, but it also is a very effective way of uh, having affordable housing in Amherst. It allows uh, owners to live in a property that they couldn't afford otherwise where they're able to rent out additional units. And so I've always been a strong advocate for that um, condition of owner occupancy. And, and so I should probably familiarize myself with what the existing bylaws are and maybe talk to the CRC since they're now in the middle of this revision is that they consider that seriously in their revision of the bylaws. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Mr. Greeny. Ms. Parks. I'll just say that I, I've had confusion over uh, the, the uh, owner occupancy versus this living manager because I remember when I first moved to Amherst, you know, there were a lot of issues with people wanting to buy a multifamily home to rent out and then finding out that it needed to be owner occupied and it really changed whether they decided to buy that property or not. And so I'm confused about is there such thing as owner occupied property anymore if you can have a resident manager or is there a property that doesn't have an owner living there but is an owner occupied property in other words it feels to me like when i first moved here if, it, if your property was owner occupied if it was a multifamily home an owner had to live there if you were renting out part of it and and so this idea of having a resident manager in lieu of an owner feels new to me and not universally understood. Am I wrong in that? Is this a new thing, the resident manager? Ms. Kamora? It's, uh, you know, I mean, it's new in the, you know, past 10, 12 years new. Uh, but there's every possible combination or, or situation out there as far as owner occupancy or, or resident manager goes. Um, this option for resident manager is specifically in the converted dwelling section of the bylaw. 
Uh, so that's very different from the duplex section, which could either be owner occupied or not owner occupied. Uh, additionally, you know, back in mid 2000, 2000, 2005, seven, almost every converted dwelling application, you'll find a condition that it be owner occupied. So, you know, as a specific condition of the permit. Uh, so the resident manager wasn't even, you know, uh, used in those cases. And you're right, you know, a new owner looking at a property may not even become aware of this until the moments before a closing when it is found through the title examination and highlighted by the closing attorney as a condition of the special permit. And that's when I get the call, what do we do? Um, you know, am I going to be in violation if I rent this tomorrow after I take ownership? It, you know, so, you know, that has absolutely happened many, many times. Um, I, I've been here since 2012. Uh, and, you know, we, we deal with it in, in, in different ways, sometimes helping the applicant modify the condition or in some cases bring the property into compliance. Uh, but yes, it's, there isn't a universal um, situation out there and every case has to be looked at. The history of each property has to be looked at to understand exactly what the conditions are. Okay, I'll just say for me that, that it, it's, it isn't clear. I know of several houses on Lincoln Avenue that are down closer to UMass where it, it's kind of like they were all meant to be owner occupied and then something happened and they are no longer, no longer have that condition. So I'm just throwing that out there that that mm -hmm. for me, that's confusing and it doesn't seem like it's been applied equally or that information has been distributed equally. Mr. Langsdale. I think part of the uh, confusion uh, for Ms. Parks and myself as well, uh, is that we're, if, we, if we're looking at a, a, a structure that is multifamily, but is like, you know, seven or eight uh, uh, apartments or bedrooms or something, that there, there's a possibility for a resident manager to be more separate uh, or in an apartment uh, building. But in a, uh, I know we, we have one that we're uh, looking at now where the resident manager would end up being one of three or four people in one structure along with a second structure. And that that puts the resident manager in a position of having to in quotes, police the others. And as Mr. Morris said, that that makes them maybe no more than a point person for, uh, for contact uh, for the, uh, the owner. Is it possible for us with each application to look at the uh, structure of the building or buildings and if it's not possible to separate the manager from the other occupants, that we refuse to make it anything but an owner occupied. I, I believe absolutely. I think, I think if you are unable to make your findings that you need to make without that arrangement, without a uh, you know, a very convincing arrangement where there's this resident management role mm -hmm. and not just the um, the written piece of that, the, not just that part of the program, but actual the physical layout to make sense. And you can connect that to that requirement. Absolutely. I think, I think, you know, a converted dwelling may not be successful if it doesn't have those elements, uh, if, if judged and looked that way. Sure. Mr. Maxfield. Yes, I mean, if it, if it all comes back down to the required findings that we have to make here, because my, uh, my general feeling is obviously I like the idea of owner occupied um, rental units more than anything else. It's always better to, in my opinion, have, uh, you know, have the, the landlord be you know, a resident of the town with an actual stake 
and what goes on here as opposed to um, some developer out of Boston who's just looking to make money, you know, shove as many people as you want in that apartment. I don't have to see it, just don't let me hear about it kind of thing. Um, but if we're talking about you know, the need to make kind of special, you know, the specific findings required, because although I don't think we could put any sort of stipulation um, saying that, you know, well, maybe it's not owner occupied, but we would like the, the owner to be somebody who's nearby in a way like we, for, you know, a resident of Amherst who's the owner, because then we know that they also have more of a stake in the community, um, more of a motivation to maintain the, the property outside of just the um, financial factor. But we couldn't say that they, the owner must live in town, I think we might be able to do some type of thing with the specific findings saying that they have to be relatively local to be able to be responsive to complaints. So rather than have necessarily an owner occupied condition, but then not dealing with the resident manager either to have something where we would want some condition to say that the, the owner needs to be able to be responsive in order to do so, they would have to be within some general proximity to the property if they wouldn't want it to be owner occupied so that we might not have to force that condition onto properties, but can still get a similar result of not seeing properties become, you know, essentially party houses and neighborhoods, which I think is a lot of what we're trying to avoid here. Um, but that idea of using specific findings to, uh, I guess, impose locality of owners, is that something that, that the board has any interest in, in, in exploring? I've not thought about that before as having sort of a town resident as a, I mean, a owner occupied, owner, owner occupied or non-owner occupied, I've never thought of town residency as a criteria that can be used to, um, as a condition. I, I don't even, I don't, you know, it's an idea, Mr. Maxfield, I, this is not something that I have thought about before. I think it might raise some questions, legal questions about, and maybe practical questions about, you know, what if the person, the owner moves out of Amherst? Um, what happens to then the, you know, the he just does. He moves out of, he moves to Hadley or he moves to, to uh, Belchertown. Does he have to sell the house? Is the house then out of compliance and he loses the ability to rent it? I'm not, I'm just not sure. Um, it's something to think about. Mr. Moore, did you have your hand up? No? Yes. Um, so just a, a part of uh, that, um, just for, for your knowledge, is that the rental regulations uh, has a provision that if the owner isn't within 20 miles, located within 20 miles of the property that they're permitting, that they must have a local manager, uh, you know, a local uh, property management company. Um, and we yeah. define what the qualifications are. And I know that's, that's just the beginning of, of what was just mentioned. So building on that, um, it, I can tell you, there's plenty of examples with uh, the zoning board special permits in the past where the property manager was, you know, almost, you know, put through an interview process through the hearing uh, to understand exactly how they were going to manage the property. Um, and although we don't necessarily tie it to a company, but we're tying it to their function and the services that they're providing. So I think it's definitely um, something to consider if um, we have a property, we know the owner's not local, Maybe we don't even know if the owner has the, the background or, or uh, qualifications to manage the property effectively. I think it's appropriate, appropriate to ask for a professional level management to be established. Perhaps it could be reviewed in time, you know, but, it, but certainly initially, that could be a, a, a very useful condition to ensure that a property uh, is managed. And looking at exactly what we find is you know, property managers have all different levels of scope and services that they provide to these owners. So really looking at what are they going to do? How are they there to respond or, um, you know, try to proactively uh, uh, deal with issues that may occur uh, on that property? Mr. Greeny. 
So the um, we know. I think it's I think it's fair to say that we know that owner occupied properties are uh, are not problem properties. Uh, the problem is that some people could easily see that as being too restrictive on a particular property, and so the what what Dylan's suggesting and apparently we have some of that in what Rob just talked about is a less restrictive but a condition that would you know give us some assurity that the property would not become a problem property so I I just like to ask Rob in your experience um, uh, property man properties that are under property management firms are they generally um, well behaved or not problem properties could you comment on that? What, what I yeah, what I can say with certainty is that the the, the properties that are managed by a uh, property management company, the grounds, the outside appearance uh, of the property is very well kept. And if there is any situation that um, uh, kind of goes out of compliance, it's dealt with really quickly. So I think that you know that is definitely. Um, proven itself. Uh, what, when, it, when it gets into things like the number of occupants, guests, um, late noise uh, coming from a property, what we learn is that the property management company may not be the person that's responsible for that situation. And it falls back to the owner. And that's when you know we get into these discussions with the owners. We just had one recently on, on Phillip Street where we needed to tell the owner that enough, you know, we've, we every few months we're having the same situation over and over again. You need to have a property manager do more. So we we uh, we, we we told them they needed to come up with a better, more thorough scope of services to manage this property that we reviewed, we agreed to, and, and we rely on that to take the property out of violation and give them the opportunity to, to, to proceed and, and hopefully do better. Uh, so we're, you know, we're using the, the, the tools that we have that way. So I think the property manager can make a big difference, uh, but what we need to be able to do is make sure that the owner's engaging them to do those extra services that they may typically not include. Good. Well, I, this has been a really interesting discussion and I think valuable, informative to me. Um, and it's the kinds of things that we you know, should be thinking about talking with each other about uh, in these kind of meetings. And maybe it's something that we wanna examine for recommendations to the CRC or the, the, the planning board at some point. Um, I know we got a, several other things that we want to go through on the agenda. And so I, I, Maureen, you said you had one more item on. Uh... Well, let, let, we'll give Rob a brief break uh, for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a commercial. So, um, so uh, well, a couple things, I guess. Uh, just there's going to be um, at these trainings, which I think, you know, we like to have maybe at least twice a year uh, or not, I mean, sorry, administrative meetings, we like to hold uh, twice a year, but, um, um, but we, you know, are definitely open to having more administrative meetings as needed. And so at these meetings, we always want to remind, uh, give everyone a refresher about the ZBA site visits, which we did tonight, and then about the open meeting law of just a reminder of, you know, outside of these meetings, we, uh, the board members shouldn't be talking about um, applications that are uh, being deliberated and, um, and perhaps even not talk about um, app applications that have now been approved and um, the project has now moved on to construction. Um, and so uh, with that, um, because that would be a violation of the open meeting law, um, additionally, uh, you know, occasionally um, someone will send an email to everyone um, of, of, of something that's uh, minor, um, such as, oh, I can't meet that site visit at 10 a.m. Can you do 12 p.m.? You know, technically those sorts of emails are fine um, that, you know, you're saying you uh, scheduling something or maybe 
uh, everyone, someone by accident sends an email to all saying, oh, I didn't receive that attachment. Can you resend that email? Technically, those sorts of emails are fine, but just to be consistent, um, we a staff uh, just reminds everyone to just uh, email, um, you know, Rob, myself, Dave, uh, Dave Boskevitz, or any staff, um, and um, we can help answer your question. Um, and then we can, uh, you know, if if there needs to be a, a reattachment or, or or the attachment was never sent, then I would then you know you would you would let me know individually, and then I would respond to everyone saying, "Oh, whoops, here's the attachment," and that would be the example. Um, a couple, and then Maureen, I can just say one thing. Yeah, I, reply all is not our friend here with the <laughs> when we're on the ZBA, and even though sometimes it's technically permitted, we're not in technical violation. Just don't take the chance. Just don't take the chance. Go through the staff for all for the communications, and it, um, that way we'll avoid inadvertently um, violating the open meeting law. Okay. And uh, uh, periodically there are trainings uh, for uh, ZBA members and planning board members. Um, I believe I sent out an email um, a couple months ago uh, about um, fall trainings. And um, I believe some of the members um, did attend a training. And uh, just as a reminder, whenever I see uh, these trainings being offered, I, I will, of course, um, forward that information to you all. And uh, the town uh, can certainly um, reimburse you for attending these uh, very useful trainings. Um, and then lastly, uh, I just wanted to mention, um, so in these COVID times, uh, um, I um, getting um, you know it uh, it's difficult to uh, of it's difficult to um, uh, get everyone information or or do special permit decision signings because uh, everyone can't come in into the meeting come into the building and you know everyone has difficulty uh, because they work uh, full time and so I'm actually looking into whether um, e-signatures would be allowed. I don't know, actually, I haven't had a chance to talk to Rob about this, but I was going to reach out to our um, our town attorney about it and uh, to our registry of deeds um, and see if that would be uh, allowed and, and whether everyone would be agreeable or if everyone thinks that's an acceptable way of signing before I even pursue asking around whether it's legal. Tammy's I'm thumb. all for it. Steve is a thumbs yeah, up. I'm, I'm all for it. Bob's a thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. All right. I well, don't I'm, mind the walk into town, but I think it's, it'd be a lot easier for everybody to, to sign it e electronically. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll look into whether it's legally acceptable um, with the registry deeds and with, I guess, the state of Massachusetts and with the town. So, okay. And uh, last, I believe, on the agenda for, for our administrative items is Article 14, um, and which is temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath. And, oh, you know, uh, Mr. Maxfield, sorry. did you have something regarding e-signatures? Uh, no, open meeting law. Uh, I wanted to just okay. get on, on, on that quickly. You said, but no, we can't talk about things that are, are currently pending or, or that we're, we're currently um, reviewing. But uh, you said in closed cases as well. So let's say it's, you know, summertime, I, I see Steve walking around town and I want to say, hey, having the, let's talk about that 40B application that we, we, what do we think we did right? What do we think we did wrong? Is that then a, a violation about talking about something we completed months ago at that point? No. Okay. No. Yeah, so, fine. Uh, you know, you're not, I, you're not I, deliberating I, before some on something that's before the board. Yeah, yeah. or so potentially we before the board. We can then speak on it. I think that's right. I should let the staff discuss that, though. I don't want to be the expert if I'm not. I, I would just suggest that um, uh, we ensure that the appeal period has expired and that we're not aware of any uh, potential litigation associated with the property, but certainly six months later or the, the, the project's under construction and you know you, you, you meet up with each other and talk about how great it turned out, you know, there's certainly no problem there. Oh, okay. Thank you for coming.
and, and you were going to talk about, we were talking about the Article 14, Maureen, or is yeah. Rob going to talk about that? Uh, Rob can talk about it. He, I think he wrote it, so. We can have the author. I did. Uh, yeah, back in uh, May, uh, you know, in response to COVID, uh, the idea was that we uh, temporarily loosen up some of the special permitting and site plan review uh, process to certain types of businesses. Uh, you know, back then we were not expecting to be in this situation still uh, at the end of the year and thought, you know, we'd be well into recovery by now and this would be useful. Uh, you know, right after we uh, proposed this to the council and had their support, the governor issued an order that, you know, essentially said notwithstanding any zoning regulation, outdoor dining can, you know, proceed under these certain conditions. So um, again, didn't really get a whole lot of use because the governor's order um, permitted uh, us to uh, allow the outdoor dining to happen. So um, we did have a few cases though throughout the summer where Article 14 was really useful. It, uh, it, it did permit uh, expansion of outdoor dining areas that are more of a permanent construction, not just set up out in the road or on the sidewalk. Uh, we actually had a hair salon set up outdoor services in individual one, you know, single service tents uh, and uh, water supply set up outdoors. Uh, so we start to, we, we did see it, it be used a couple of times. And as it was uh, originally uh, adopted, it was, it, it had a six month duration. So as that was coming to an end in, in the beginning of December, uh, we went back to the board last, to the council last month and asked to extend it entirely through 2021. And we expanded it quite a bit. Uh, so we, we did identify the difference between a, a permanent use and a temporary use. And we got a lot of requests for temporary uses. That would, you know, attend at, uh, the survival center or a church or the schools. Uh, and we expect that we'll probably have the same requests again in the spring. So we, you know, we built in a number of what we could think of as probably, you know, likely to, to be asked along the way. Uh, we also included farm stands and um, medical establishments uh, not knowing what would be uh, needed for, uh, you know, rolling out even the vaccine, you know, whether it be temporary structures or uh, uh, areas designated for that purpose. So what we wanted to do is ensure that there wasn't a 90 day process to allow this to happen. Uh, but we didn't want to bypass all the zoning bylaw requirements entirely. So essentially what happens is uh, I conduct a review with other staff uh, and it, in, in the hopes of issuing an administrative approval that satisfies the special permit requirement does not require the applicant com to come in front of the board, but I am responsible to ensure that the 10.38 findings are applied properly, uh, all conditions of the bylaw are met, um, I can't grant a waiver any different than what the bylaw says can be waived. Uh, there's still no variances and things like that. So uh, the bylaw itself doesn't change except for the, the approval process. So uh, restaurants are definitely one uh, that's in this category and most likely to be used. Uh, uh, retail establishments and likely medical facilities. Uh, I'm expecting to be to be used through these sections. So uh, the board shouldn't be surprised if they see a new restaurant open uh, downtown, for example, that didn't have come in front of the board because during this time, Article 14 actually will allow that to happen through an administrative approval that we conduct uh, entirely by staff. Um, this is uh, specific to zoning, certain zoning districts. It doesn't include any residential property, like you know our discussions tonight about um, owner-occupied, non-owner-occupied residential properties. Those are not subject to this. Uh, there will be temporary or permanent situations that happen. Uh, so far, we've uh, we've granted two administrative approvals for permanent. Uh, 
situations and one is an expansion of the outdoor dining at Stacker's Bar uh, downtown in the back. Uh, they had a patio. Uh, they expanded the patio to uh, accommodate additional seating for the spring. Uh, that's a permanent change being proposed, not just a temporary outdoor dining setup. Uh, so we were able to find that acceptable and, and, and grant that approval. And there was another one uh, just down the road where the old Bart's ice cream uh, shop is, uh, again, for a couple of outdoor seats in a permanent uh, placement on private property. Uh, so that's it so far. There's a lot of discussions happening with potential restaurants uh the opening in town or, or filling some of the vacant uh, uh spaces downtown uh but we expect this to go well into next year before it's actually used any further so rob how long is is this is article 14 contemplated to be in effect is it going to, is this it's just it's it's mostly covid related right and it's supposed to um, was supposed to expire at a, a point in time. Is there a date or is this something that the council has to look at and, and then uh, sort of uh, delist it at some point? It, it automatically expires December 31st of 2021. Okay. So up until that time, an administrative approval can be granted. It doesn't mean that the work has to occur or uh, you know the use open, but the approval would be granted. Uh, by that time frame uh, and be uh, covered by Article 14. Uh, the decisions are recorded with the town clerk's office and you know are are just as real as a special permit would have been mm -hmm. and in the future will be you know viewed as a legitimate uh, uh, permit. Uh, even if the even if that same establishment has to come back to the zoning board five years from now uh, to alter or expand it would be an alter alteration or expansion of that administrative approval uh, that was that was granted during this time. Uh, so yeah, next all of next year, uh, and and then I would imagine September October of twenty one, the council will decide if there's any need to extend it or just let it expire and go back to whatever our new bylaw might say. Mr. Barrick. Oh, uh, we, we can't hear you. There you go. Right. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, th these changes all, all seem like a very good idea. Uh, would it make sense for for you as you make as you issue these permits to have some procedure for notifying this board so that we can be aware of what you're doing uh, and uh, should it seem to people on the board that you you were doing either less or more uh, than seemed advisable there could be a feedback loop to advise you you know not not to over not not to overturn your decisions but to to make sure that the the, the zba like a year from now not find itself totally out of sync with what you have been doing absolutely uh i think maureen and i can and can can talk about a way of making sure the board's informed if there are more administrative meetings like these i'd be happy to give a report of what we did during that period leading up to that and i welcome feedback and any suggestions that the board have at any time you can always reach out to maureen or, or i individually uh if you see something happening and have questions about it just want to understand what went into making that decision be happy to spend time on that and, and please understand that I say this not in, in any way to disagree with what you're doing, but just to, to try to assure that there is some uh, mutual understanding between you and the board going forward. Absolutely. Really good, good suggestion, Mr. Barrick. Thank you. Maureen, uh, Ms. Pollock. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, during the review process through the the administrative uh, review process with the building commissioner, um, the applicant would need to put a sign at their door, at the entranceway of their door or on the front window or the siding of the door um, to indicate to the public that they are requesting um, an administrative uh, approval for their proposed project. Uh, so as a way to inform members of the public. Langsdale. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Pollock, is that a standardized uh, form or 
is each com uh, entity going to make up their own? <clears throat> I believe uh, Rob and Inspection Services are working on a template okay. of what time would look like. That's right. It doesn't have to be any uh, particular uh, notice. Uh, it's not a town notice, so it's not on town letterhead, but we did put a template in the application that uh, mainly to, to ensure that certain information is put on the notice uh, and that it be uh, the location, um, you know, of a size that can be read uh, and for a duration of not less than 10 days prior to the, uh, the, the, the work beginning or the approval occurring. Uh, those were you know, some of the basic criteria and our information so that they can contact us with questions. Okay. Mr. Wasiewicz. Yeah, Rob, can you speak to whether or not the abutters are notified in their participation in that? The abutters are not notified. So again, this the, the whole purpose of this effort is to um, to speed up the process, uh, to get the business open again, to get the business adjusting to whatever uh, um, <laughs> mandate from the state or guidance requires uh, mm -hmm. them to make changes and uh, give them the ability to uh, hopefully be uh, as successful as they can during this time. However, that 10 day notice that's required is an opportunity for anybody to contact uh, our office uh, and give suggestions or feedback. Um, you know, not that I would expect this to occur, but if there was an aggrieved uh, party to any approval, uh, my decision for the administrative approval would be appealed to the zoning board, uh, just like any other appeal uh, would be heard. Uh, and that's, that's specifically written into the article 14 as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's not a, a formal notice. Great. Thanks for the update. And uh, we will, um, look forward to updates and uh, continuing conversation about this, Mr. Moore. I think that'd be really helpful for the board. Um, Maureen, did you, did you um, have a back to the uh, item, uh, on whether the board has any recommendations to the planning board about zoning bylaw amendments. Um, do folks want to email me whether you have um, suggestions uh, or recommendations rather, or uh, should we just go ahead and plan out an administrative meeting now and in, in the future, like in a month or, or so? How would that? I think collecting, you know, I think my impression is collecting some emails is a good idea. I think that Asking all of us to do our homework on the zoning bylaws over Christmas is, and the holidays is going to be tough. Um, so I think that a month is too quick for this. Um, I'm going to, I plan on doing other things in reading the zoning bylaws for Christmas, but um, I'm going to do some of that in January when it's cold and I have nothing else to do. So uh, how about we, how about good ideas go to, go to you, Maureen, and to Rob and to Dave? That's a great idea then let's try to have some kind of a meeting. If we have some good ideas in February, um, maybe the end of February, is that gonna to be too late, Rob? No, at the end of February, we'll, we can have another administrative meeting, we can discuss it and have some ideas at that point. Why don't we do it that way? And it frees up everybody's Christmas or holidays as best as possible, okay. Oh. Yep, do you have anything else, Ms. Pollock? No. Look, Mr. Greeny. Go up here. No. Uh, so can we, can those be shared if people are sending? They can't, okay. So one last thing that I had is one of the things that I'm, that I am challenged with is site plans and all the different plans that we get. When we have a big project, uh, mm -hmm. especially I think of recent projects, there are 15 or 15 sheets that are gigantic and the ones that challenge me are the site plans the drainage the different the traffic the power the um the grading all the, the lighting all those are, are confusing to me because i've never dealt with that i don't have a problem 
with the interior. I've built out office spaces before, managed building out office spaces before. So that doesn't, that isn't as confusing, but the other stuff is confusing to me. And I don't know if that, and so I would like to have the town engineer or somebody sit down via Zoom and go through what exactly what those plans are. So I'm more, I'm not relearning every single time I see one. And if, I don't know if other people on the board are interested in doing that, if that would be helpful, I would be happy to try to set something up. We could do an administrative meeting so that we better understand those, those uh, documents that we get in front of us. I think we'll do a better job as a board if we do that. But I'm wondering if that's something that people are interested in or should I just go off and do it myself? If you're interested, raise your hand. Great. Well, we could have class. We'll have a virtual class on reading site plans. Um, and maybe we can work together to do that. Again, not during Christmas, but uh, after in January or February. All right, Maureen, does that sound like a good idea? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, one, uh, I guess a couple of questions. So what is it um, sort of the whole plan set of you wanna be walk through the plan set or are there yeah. individual sheets like walk, a- stormwater? Walk through the plan set, you know, walk through the plan set, kind of understand what level of details we need to have before we can make a decision, how much modification and much additional detail is made after we make a decision before construction, just that kind of, so that it's everything from what that squiggle means to why there's, there's 15 pages in front of me, what do all those pages are, and then how, do they, how does that change during the process from application to construction? Is that? Yeah, sure, and um, you know, we could do sort of two, um, uh, two di different types of projects. Maybe one is a larger project, like, like a mixed use project, uh, maybe a project the board has previously approved. Yeah. And then maybe a small, uh, you know, a duplex or something, uh, just as a contrast of a, a small, smaller project versus a, a much larger, more detailed, which gets maybe into fill and m m much more detail about stormwater. That would be great. Sure. That'd be a good way to approach it. And I also want to just open this up for any, for, for, that's the last of the things I have on my agenda. So I just want to open it up for anybody on the board. Um, if they have a comment, a suggestion, a question, um, or something that they'd like to get off their chest, uh, even uh, this is a good time to do that. And just remember, we have a public meeting. So um, this, is, this, is, this is being recorded, but um, this is an opportunity for any discussion on, on anything. Ms. Parks. So I'm just wondering if when we bring it, these uh, items up to the planning board, if we can bring up some of the items um, that are not real clear, like, um, you know, what does it mean to say substantially more detrimental to, to a neighborhood? You know, some of the things that we struggled with over the last six months, um, you know, a buffer zone, whether you can act, whether parking lot counts as part of a business related to buffer zones, stuff like that. I'm wondering if we can, uh, you know, kind of ask the planning board to give us more detailed information on, on those kind of open items there or not fully defined items to me. Um, so that was one thing. And the other thing is, I just wanted to say, Steve, I think you're doing a really great job. It's really wonderful to work with you. I think you're very, um, uh, you work really well with the public, especially if people are getting uh, concerned. And so I just really appreciate uh, the job you're doing. So I wanted to thank you. Thank you. That's kind. I couldn't, have, I can't do it without all you, so. That goes to everybody on the board and all the staff. I think we've done a really good job and that's, that's a compliment to all of you. So thank you very much, Tammy. I appreciate that. Mr. Langsdale. Um, I'd like to echo her uh, words about you. I think you're doing a marvelous job and uh, it's very, you have very strong, but uh, uh, contemplative leadership. Uh, I would also like to thank Mr. Mora for being here because I think the more we as a board understand the processes that he goes through, uh, the, the clearer we can be in terms of uh, conditions that we want to uh, put on any certain project. Uh, and the more we understand the, um, 
uh, I don't know, problems, uh, limitations that he has to deal with, I think it also uh, enhances what we're able to do uh, on the board with each application. So thank you. I echo that. Great. Um, Ms. Parks. Just really quick, I also want to say big thank you to Maureen for always mm -hmm. being really wonderful and getting everything to us. And, you know, thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate you. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Yeah. All right. Well, that settles. That's, I think that's everything for the agenda tonight. Um, unless there's anything else that anybody wants to say. Oh, one more thing. All right, Maureen. Um, we do uh, have the uh, general public comment period. That's correct. Um, but we're done with the, the comment from the board. Yep, the administrative stuff. We have one last thing is the general comment period for any matter not before the board tonight. Um, and if there's anybody from the public who wishes to make a comment, this is the time to do it. I see no raised hands. So um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Mr. Maxfield? Uh, seconded. All right, motion is made and seconded. Any discussion? Oh, we, you don't discuss a motion to do, adjourn. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> so you, that's the reason, you, that's the reason you, you do this. So there is no discussion on that. It's a roll call vote. I vote aye. Ms. O'Meara? Oh. <laughs> Sounds like Ms. O'Meara's dog is voting aye. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Greeny? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everybody. Motion carries. It's unanimous. Um, have a good night. Have a good holiday season, if 